We're going to talk about raising children. Okay, that's a big topic since just about everybody has children except for the few brahmacharis. No more brahmacharis. Okay, we got one brahmachari here. So we're going to talk about how to raise children or how to raise brahmacharis. <laughs> if you're a brahmachari leader. So there's two things, two questions came up right now I really want to touch upon. One is the cultural problem in every society, it's not just Indian society, where if the women express their needs, what do the men say? It's not a need. No, they say, you are needy. <laughs> Any of the women hear, hear that? Yes. You're too needy. You're too needy. <laughs> so you have to be careful how you express that. Uh, maybe you don't want to use the word need, you use the word value. Or even, you know, desire, whatever you want to use, but that is a cultural problem. That generally the men think you're too needy, you need this, you need that, you're always asking for something. And the men, they don't have any needs. <laughs> or they're, they don't want to reveal, you know, for a man to be vulnerable, for a man to cry, is very difficult. Men are very stoic. And they keep it all inside and they develop diseases because they keep it all inside. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, one thing I wanted to illustrate, and I think I need some chairs for this. Do it. Can I have another th three chairs up here, real quickly? I'm going to illustrate, hopefully, using empathic communication, how to deal, let's say, in the workplace or in another situation, if someone comes and tells you something that evokes, let's say, anger or a need, but, uh, an emotion that is not a pleasant emotion. Okay, I got four chairs. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, this is gonna be a little difficult. Who is the most offensive person in the room? Okay, you're the most offensive. Okay, I know that's a dick. But if you don't mind offending me. Uh oh. <laughs> I'll do it. Okay, he's he's good for it. So here, I'm going to describe four different ways, or illustrate four different ways of responding to what you would generally call an insult. And you're, you're going to commit a mad elephant offense. Uh, you're going to commit... <laughs> oh, you're Christian, too. I didn't know what else to do. Yeah. <laughs> so you're going you're gonna to insult me. I mean, uh, in any situation, as a devotee or whatever, you know, just... All right, let's say as the person giving the seminar, you're going to say something really insulting about me. And I'm going to show you different ways we have of responding. And empathic ways and non-empathic ways of responding. Okay. You ready? Marge, I like you and all. It's a great seminar. I really Great think seminar. You didn't insult me yet. I'm getting there. I think you're too impatient. Maybe you need to slow down a little bit so I can respond to you. Uh, Give me some names. You know, you're useless, an idiot or something. <laughs> You're not so good at this. Hare Krishna. <laughs> you have to learn the technique. <laughs> You're Ramchandra Puri. Your attitude is just despicable. You have a... You, you're proud, uh, terrible facilitator. You're simply making us laugh without giving us any real content. It's, it's a waste of our time, but I'm just sitting here to see what I can glean out of it so I can put on Facebook that I'm sick and tired of sannyasis, not... Okay. I think that's enough. Okay. Remember what you just said, you're going to repeat it again. Now, 
Give him the microphone, give him the microphone. Okay, the first way I have is I just hear all those things and I apply them myself. I'm useless, I'm hopeless, I'm boring with a little humor. But uh, I'm not conveying the information. What an idiot I am. What am I doing here? I'm depressed. Uh, as I feel bad about myself. That's one way of responding. In the workplace, that happens. You, know, you, you take it upon yourself, yes, everything, every designation, every diagnosis they gave is absolutely correct. I should just end it all. Finished. And then you, you come home and you get angry with your family after that. <laughs> take it out of your family. Okay, insult me again. <laughs> Second chair. Marge, I liked your seminar, but actually I didn't like but. it. <laughs> but, you know, I, I just find it so strange that sannyasis would joke around when, when you have to be serious. One of the qualities of devotees is to be grave. What are you ex exhibiting? And what is the content we're learning from this Marshall Rosenberg person who's not got anything to do with Prabhupada? You're just I, an I agitated feel... fanatic. What do you know about Krishna consciousness? I've been in the movement so many years. Before you were even born, I was chanting Hare Krishna. That I'm a, is true, I'm a, and that is the problem. I'm a Prabhupada you... disciple. What are you? I'm an I'm a objective person who sees that you just are not doing the right thing. I think you're you guys, completely in it's illusion. It's been too many years of practice. That's the problem. I think you're it's just been a dog. Like weird off the you side know what of the your road. next birth is going to be? This is what I mean. I mean, you you're going to be a Look cockroach. You're exhibiting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, you're going to do it again. I told you. 50%. Anybody else want to do the other 50%? <laughs> no, so the first point is these are non empathic responses. The first thing is you blame yourself, which happens a lot. The next one is you blame the other person. Okay? And so you blame. So it's all blame, put a label. So I put a label on myself. I, I made judgments, I put a diagnosis on myself. Now I'm giving a diagnosis to him. And in both cases, I feel miserable. Me too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're doing service. All right, and so the next chair, let's see you do your thing. Marge, you talk so much about health. I saw you eating the donut out there. <laughs> so I think that's hypocrisy. I think you're just a hypocrite. You have this dress of a sannyasi, this orange stuff, but it's just maybe, you know, like how the uh, construction workers have uh, those, whatever you call them, like, reflectors. There you go, it's just a reflector to get more attention. That's what I feel. I feel. Okay. <laughs> so, so, this one, I would. This is necessary before showing empathy for him. He's in pain, but I'm in pain. So when you're in pain, for one reason or other, your need is not being met, then you go within yourself and you think, well, he just said, you know, that I'm not really renounced. I'm just a sense gratifier. <laughs> and. I have a need for appreciation, understanding, different needs for, for love, loving relationships. These are all my basic needs. And I'm not really depending on him to fulfill those needs. I have other strategies. So as soon as you, the interesting thing is as soon as you drill down and you think about your needs, you don't blame him anymore. Remember I was blaming him or blaming myself. I'm just understanding my feelings. I'm feeling really sad. I'm feeling anxiety. And the reason I'm feeling, I take responsibility for my feelings is because I have these basic needs. I'm not embarrassed about my needs. I mean, I'm not telling him right now, 
you know, I have this need for love. Do you love me? No, I, I'm, not, I'm not conveying that. It's all internal, you know, taking the time and just processing internally before responding. You know, think before responding. One interesting thing about modern technology is especially with the internet, you don't think before responding. You send a letter, press the send button, and you feel good <laughs> until the next morning. Because <laughs> there's no way to retrieve an email. There was one person, I think it was Benjamin Franklin, who said he, he would write a letter, put it in his desk drawer, and the next morning he would open up and rip it up. So with modern technology, we have this tendency to have instant response, right? Which is really not going to help us that much. So instead, you know, I process everything. I'm feeling really bad needs, whatever the need is, you know, empathy, understanding, compassion. And in my mind, I have strategies in mind how to fulfill that. Not with him, obviously. <laughs> Okay, and all right, so I'm going to stay in this chair right now. Insult me again. Marge, I like your seminar, but I, I think it's too boring, actually. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't give me what I need. Oh, uh, it's, hey, you, you, you insult just, me personally. Yeah, I, yeah, I figured it. <laughs> you're you're um, a jerk. You're not a... You're not really a sannyasi. I, I, I don't think you have the teachings of Prabhupada imbibed in you. I don't think you're a good disciple. Because it seems like you're just giving us wishy-washy stuff. Okay. So what I do at this point, I'm still in this chair, is I do exactly what I said before. I hear what he said, understand <coughs> my emotions. You know, I'm damn angry. <laughs> not just angry. And... I understand the needs. I'm taking responsibility. Yeah, I'm feeling this way because I have this need. And, you know, I'm sort of like calm down at this point. Then I could switch to this chair. And, of course, I don't say to him, are you saying this because you have a need to be punched in the mouth? No, are you... <laughs> are you saying... No, I need you to lose feet. <laughs> no, no, no. Are you... I, I'm thinking, you know, He's in pain. And I may even guess in my mind, I may show empathy for him. But, but I know he is in pain because the only reason, and I see this on the internet all the time, that people are sending all these hellish criticisms. I mean, if you, if you Google anyone, any leader's name in ISKCON, I mean, it's Vaishnava Parada, you know, there. But these people are in pain. They have unmet needs. So I'm saying, first of all, I'm seeing his pain. And then I'm thinking, you know, who knows? You know, what is his unmet need? I mean, maybe his wife yelled at him this morning or something like that. <laughs> I don't say that to him. That would be really non-productive. So I say that in my mind, thinking that, being compassionate to him. And then what I do is, you know, after a while, I can keep switching back and forth between the two chairs because also I have the need for, for these things. But you really have to or need to uh, be aware of your own needs before you can respond to someone in such a situation like that. Otherwise, you will respond unempathically. Okay, thank you for the offenses. <laughs> Yamaraj will deal with you later. <laughs> nice I mean, going, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That. So, joke, joking aside, let's take the example of uh, Haridas Thakur. Now, he was being whipped so many marketplaces, right? And he was noticing... What was he noticing? Can anyone tell me what he was noticing? No one knows. He was noticing the pain of someone else. Who was he noticing the pain of? Yes. 
Yeah, the people who were beating him. He was, he was saying to them, why are you in pain? And they said, well, because we're beating you and you're not dead. We're going to get in trouble. You know, they were shaking in anxiety because they were worried that they were going to get in trouble. And Hardy Asakwar said, oh, is that it? No problem. And then he made himself, he put himself into trance. And then at that point, they weren't in anxiety. And then they brought, of course, you know that they brought his body or they brought him uh, to the Nawab. And then he was thrown into the river and he floated down the river and he came out of the river and he started to chant Hare Krishna again. <laughs> Don't try that at home. <laughs> Because uh, Lord Chaitanya was protecting his back. Like they have the saying, you know, he's got my back. So Lord Chaitanya has our back in that way. We have to be assured of that. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has our back and our guru has our back. Similar story with Pallad Maharaj. Pallad Maharaj, of course, was being attacked or attempts were made on his life by his father or the behest of his father so many times. And then finally, Lord Nisingadev appeared and Pallad Maharaj was asked by Lord Nisingadev, what do you want? And most of us would say, I got a list, my dear Lord. <laughs> Let me check my computer. So Pallad Maharaj said, no, I'm not a, I'm not a Baniya. I'm not a Baniya. I'm not a businessman. So all I want, I am your servant and you're my master. That is our, our relationship. That's nice. But then he asked for something. He asked, first of all, he said, I'm uh, overcome with compassion for all the conditioned souls and, you know, especially about my father here. I'm just paraphrasing. So please, what? Save my father. And so Pallad Maharaj became the uh, source of the, let's see, liberation. Of course, his father was already a devotee. It's a pastime. I understand that. But Pallad Maharaj, by his prayers and his tolerance, you know, people were asking about tolerance, he was able to uh, feel compassion for someone who was attempting to torture him. Now, that may not be at the pro uh, platform that we're at right now. Don't imitate him either. But these are inspirational uh, personalities for us. These are role models for us. Those who have actually saw, seeing the compassion of others because they're taking, they are also taking care of their own needs, but in a spiritual way. So, does anyone have any questions about the exercise we just did before we go on to something else? Yes. Microphone. Hare Krishna Maharaj. So, so what is the message that because I don't see a complete solution for this one at the end because in this exercise you are still leaving the opponent with the same mindset of he's, he's no, You don't see him as your opponent anymore. That's the first point. Uh, because you have changed your mindset or your heart set with him, uh, it's not necessarily true that he'll change, but there's a possibility of him changing. Because compassion Empathy can be communicated with one's body language. So it's not, I'm not saying we're presenting a solution for changing someone else or manipulating someone else or changing their behavior. That's not the point. But myself, when I was in that situation, I was able to feel compassionate for the other person. Like, let's say, or even the, the example we just gave before we were talking to some people about Jesus Christ. He was being pinned to the cross. And he said, forgive them, Lord, they know not what they do. It's not that those people became much more God conscious or anything like that. But he was able to be compassionate. And when you're able, to, if a Vaishnava is able to be compassionate, not only using, you know, pathic communication, which is a skill in the material world, applicable to Krishna consciousness, but if Vaishnava can pray for the other person. It's very powerful. What I find is a very powerful type of prayer is that if you have someone who doesn't like you, of course, we want to get to the point of 
not hating anyone. Ajata Shatrava Shanta Shadava Sadabhushana, as Lord Kapiladev said. When you have someone who doesn't like you, then praying for their benefit. That's spiritual success. Vanchakalpa Thuruvyascha. Kripa Sindhu Vyavacha. Why is it Kripa Sindhu? Because he's an ocean. Ocean means what? Unlimited. So it's success that I was able to connect to him. He may not connect to me. He may. There's a chance in the future he may. But that I was able to connect to him and feel compassion. That is success in and of itself. Like Pallad Maharaj was not able to change his father. But because he was a Vaishnava, he was able to save his father. You, you, you understand? That's, that's a great success. If I can pray. So what I do sometimes when I chant Japa, I pray for the person who doesn't like me. That's the point. To understand that no one is your enemy. Even, let's take the Ramayan story. After Indrajit was killed, and all the monkeys and everybody, you know, the bears, monkeys, and everybody, they wanted to tear Indrajit's body apart, right? But what did Lord Ram do? Does anyone know? Yeah. I, um, I think he sent it back to Ravana to perform the last rites. Properly. Yeah, with honor. I think with Lord honor. Ram even covered the body with his own cloth, if I remember correctly from the Ramayana. Yeah. That he covered with his, with, there was no question of he's my enemy. Our animosity has ended with his death. So that's a Vaishnava. A Vaishnava does, it doesn't have any enemies. I mean, even, let's say even Prabhupada, who was arguing with Mr. Uh, with Mr. Patel on the beach, and I've told that story before, like it appeared that Prabhupada really didn't, but Prabhupada loved him. Like when Prabhupada would go for a walk and Mr. Patel wasn't there, he said, where's Mr. Patel? Get Mr. Patel. <laughs> And even Mr. Nair, who Prabhupada was happy with when Mr. Nair disappeared from this world because Prabhupada was able to get the Bombay land and everything like that. You know, Prabhupada was compassionate towards him. Prabhupada was compassionate towards Mrs. Mrs. Nair. You read the story about Mrs. Nair? Anyone's read the story? She had arranged that our temple was attacked. You know, the uh, Bombay, Mumbai temple. That it was in a shed and she had arranged that the municipality went in and started to tear apart the shed where the deities were. And the Bujari had to be dragged away from the deities. And they were just getting to the point of just, you know, destroying the whole temple around the deities and maybe the deities would have gotten hurt or whatever. And when our friends were able to stop it. But Prabhupada later on said to Mrs. Nair, uh, when she finally signed the contract, <laughs> You are just my, like my daughter. I will make sure you're taken care of for the rest of your life. So Vaishnava, we, we really have to imbibe that quality of ajata shatru, having no enemies. And in that regard, I had another question during the uh, during the break. What uh, this was asked, you know, I'm at my workplace. It's, it, that's what brought out this whole exercise. I'm at my workplace. What happens if people say something to you for no reason? That's, that was the question that stimulated me to do this exercise. You know, said something that evoked a negative response or critical or something of you for no reason. And my response is that there's always a reason that people say, it, say something like that. And it always has to do with their needs. It's not you. You do not own anyone else's needs or you're not responsible for fulfilling anyone else's needs you can volunteer to do it but that is not your responsibility everything should be done joyfully so if someone is agitated you didn't make them agitated it is their unfulfilled needs that made them agitated and that's how I saw that particular individual who was a demon insulting me, <laughs> sorry, uh, that he had unfulfilled needs. But I had to deal with my own needs first. You can't be compassionate unless you're centered. It just doesn't work like that. Okay?
Maharaj, I have yeah. an extended question to this. So, I think here your communicate, I mean, this non-violent communication works perfectly. I mean, if if this the second person is from outside, like at a workplace, but within the family where we have to see each other, right? So, w wouldn't the opposite person take it as a, a weakness of the other person that he is he is not responding, he is not communicating back? But you are responding. So you're, you, in a, you may respond in a different way in your family. You may say, you know, can I, can I think about what you're saying for a while and take a walk? I mean, there's different situations. I mean, uh, like in one particular, like the second chair here, I responded like attacking him. So instead of doing that, which really doesn't help, because he just responded attacking me more the more I attacked him then I would just ask for some time out. Can I go for a walk and respond to what you're saying? And I come back, and in a family, of course, you can guess a little bit more about someone's feelings and someone's needs. You, you'll find it very helpful in a family situation to do that, but then you may just have to do it empathically with one's body, with your body language or tone of voice. Every situation is different, but if you are empathic and understanding or attempting to understand someone's feelings and needs, there's more of a chance of resolution. Nothing's guaranteed. Nothing's guaranteed, but you have more opportunity to resolve it. And it requires a lot of intelligence how to apply it. It's not, I can't give you a standard set of rules that if, if she says this, you do this. You know, you pick out your, your piece of paper you say, and you'll say if your wife says uh, that you're just a mess, you never clean up your clothes or anything like that, and you say, give me a second, dear. <laughs> Are you feeling frustrated, <laughs> angry? Pick one out of the two, or out of one of the ten. Here, here's a list, dear, you know. <laughs> Because you have a need for, well, I got my whole, I have my whole need list here anyway. Are you affiliated because you have a need for autonomy, celebration, integrity, interdependence, spiritual community, play, physical nurturance? What is your need, dear? It won't work. You have... You have to deal with your own needs first, then, then you, can, you can connect. If you're agitated, you're not going to be able to connect. It just takes one person to know this process of empathic communication, nonviolent communication. It doesn't take two. If two, it's better. But one person, and then it happens. It's like magic, because people need, the main thing that people need is connection. One thing, we, main thing we're lacking is connection with each other. And that satisfies a lot of needs. So, any other questions? Thank you, Maharaj. I, uh, so I live with roommates and there's one of the roommates who's very loud and very strong. Very loud. Yeah. That's, uh, can you give me more of an observation? Of course, you couldn't say so many decibels. Okay. So, uh, how, what do they say? Um, things about house rules, um, the way things should be done in the house and most of the time it turns out whatever she says is right and whatever other has to suggest. Most of the time. Give me one example. One particular instance. Um, like the other day she said... She said that she wanted to transfer the house rent to one of the other girl. Okay. And she wanted... Because they had bank accounts in different banks. Yeah. She wanted to have details and I suggested to use an app which can transfer the money. But she said, I don't think that's safe enough. Which I don't think it's true. We, I am I'm using an app since a long time and it's not a problem. Alright, so but what need do you think she has? Safety. Yeah. And she has different strategies than you. If you appreciate her need, if you appreciate her need, you may judge that she's overreacting. That's a judgment. 
but to appreciate her need. And your need, first of all, go to your need. You're, you have a need for efficiency. An app is very efficient, right? Just press a button on your phone, you can take care of everything and transfer the money, no problem. Instead, you want to go to the bank, you're stupid. <laughs> Waste of time, right? Are you thinking like that? Kind of. <laughs> Are you? <laughs> so you, you're, putting, you're putting these labels on her because she, she's just acting in terms of what you think is like ridiculous waste of time when you can accomplish everything with an app. And, but she is simply feeling, I have a need for security for my money. I mean, it's a big need. Security is a big need. I mean, just like even this morning, there was something, you know, I looked at the news and it says that this particular credit reporting agency has been hacked. Experian. You heard about that before? And he said, you better go freeze all your credit reports. So immediately I went on the internet. I needed for security. I went to all the three <laughs> uh, credit reporting agencies, Experian, TransUnion, TransUnion, what's the other one? Equifax. What? Equifax. Okay. And Equifax. And I, and I, and I just froze it because I had a need for security. Someone may say, you're just paranoid. Yeah, maybe I am. But, you know, I don't want anyone adopting my identity, putting on sannyas robes and talking here instead of me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. Try, try to see the need behind her actions and be aware of your own needs. That, she may not change. It's not a method for changing her, but it's a method for changing the way you look at things. And that's a method, perhaps, for having a better relationship with her and being more compassionate with her. Because right now you have enemy images towards her. <laughs> really, you're putting labels on her. You know, she's too loud, she's obnoxious. Is she obnoxious? <laughs> <laughs> she's pushy, she always wants her own way. Great roommate. <laughs> my how many how many temple presidents do we have like that here? So, so, so think about it. Everyone, I'll be starting the whole seminar. Everyone acts, thinks, and does things to fulfill basic human needs, which we all have. But their strategies are different. Sometimes the strategies are not so productive. I mean, I can criticize some of the strategies, like we were talking about my friend Robin. Robin just had a need for love and acceptance and appreciation. So instead of giving a seminar like me, he stole C to Davy. <laughs> So this is, this is keeping me from kidnapping young girls. Anyway, so, so anyway, so, joking, joking aside. Robin, he had these, ba he had basic human needs. I understand it's a pastime. I'm not going to get into that ang angle of vision. So we can be compassionate even with, a, with someone who we term a demon. He's acting like a demon, but ultimately he's part and parcel of Krishna. He's... Ajivera Surupahoy Nitya Krishna Das. That's actually Ravana's position. So if we see like that, it'll be very easy for us to, uh, easier for us to bring people to Krishna consciousness. I remember one, one devotee, a friend of mine, he would go out in Sankirtan and tell people they were like hogs, dogs, camels, and asses. Wow. Wow. True. They're acting like hogs, dogs, cats. That's Bhagavatam. I'm not going to. I'm not going to deny Bhagavatam's descriptions. It's not so productive to see people like that when you're distributing books. Hello, Mr. Hog. <laughs> you're just a dog. What to speak of an ass? You know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so so better. I better. I see people as devotees. They just don't know they're devotees. 
So that's true. That's beyond upadi. Sarva upadi vinir muktam tat paratwena nir malam rishikena rishikesha sevanam bhakti rishite. We have to end now or what? Timekeeper? You said 1.30. Okay, so we're going to finish up this afternoon. And tomorrow we have, uh, in the afternoon, we have questions and just questions and answers about anything. Everything you wanted to ask, but we're afraid to ask. <laughs> and I'm open to any sort of question tomorrow afternoon. This afternoon, I would... I was thinking it would be a good idea to how to go in through how to raise children in Krishna consciousness as the final portion of the seminar. Thank you very much. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai. We meet again in what?